been thinking a lot recently about what it means to make a difference and and maybe even more specifically what it means to make a difference with your art. Can you only make a difference with your art if you spell out all of the meaning and purpose behind the work that you create? Can you only make a difference with your art if you work for a nonprofit or a socially conscious brand? Or is there more to it than that? Is there an ability that we have to perhaps move hearts and minds just by creating beauty, just by filling the world with good things? And while we're kind of on this topic, what is defined as art? Can you create art if you're not a painter or a designer or a photographer or a musician? I'm so excited this week to have Andy J. Miller on the podcast, or as many folks know him online, Andy J. Pizza. Andy is somebody who, for me, has clarified all of these questions to some degree. He's somebody who I think lives out these questions, and I would almost call him an expert on this idea of of how you can move the needle with art uh, and maybe do it in ways that we don't often think of as traditional Andy is an illustrator, super talented. He's the host of the podcast Creative Pep Talk, one of my favorites, and he's a public speaker and he's so engaging. Andy is just this wonderful blend of optimistic and real. If you check out his Instagram and you take a peek at his illustrations, they are colorful and they're playful and they're fun. And his podcast is energetic and peppy and hopeful. At the same time, he's also willing to go deep. He's not just keeping things on this high optimistic level. He's willing to dive in and share about his struggles and ultimately use that to encourage and support people. And that's something that I think we dive into a lot on this podcast is people who are really willing to go there. And that's where we get to find connection. We always connect more with our struggles than our successes, more on our weaknesses than our strengths. Oh my goodness, Andy is just somebody who I deeply admire for his ability to do that. Andy is also kind of a big deal. He has created illustrations and done work for clients like the New York Times and Nickelodeon and Amazon and YouTube and Warby Parker. And I am pretty sure you've seen his work, whether you knew that it was him that did it or not. Andy is also the founder, like I said, of Creative Pep Talk, the podcast, which is just so wonderful and has been featured by Apple and BuzzFeed and Threadless. And he also released Creative Pep Talk, the book, uh, in September of 2017. I'm not lying when I say that this is one of my favorite conversations that I've had in a long time. For those who are new, I am Brandon Harvey. This is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. Sounds Good is not your typical three steps to success podcast. We don't host this podcast for the sake of leaving you with bullet points on self-improvement. We just believe that our lives are more complex than that. And so we show up here on Sounds Good to ask big questions, dive into nuance, and learn from each other's stories. So without any further ado, I'm so excited to dive straight into this conversation. I don't normally drink coffee. I generally am pretty energetic without coffee. But today, about 30 minutes ago, I just drank a, a big, tall coffee. And I'm <laughs> wired right now. Good. And, and I'm like that every day. Good. Good. I, and there's th- that's what I was kind of thinking. There's some episodes where if I was wired, I think it would be disrespectful. I think it, sure. would, be, it would just be a weird fit where somebody's, you know sharing a lot of stuff and I'm and I'm really energetic but I feel like you are somebody who your energy gives me energy uh yeah. just from listening to your podcast and following you online and so I feel like I'm here to match your energy and so I would have been highly offended had you not partaken in coffee today good good well I'm glad that I've lived up to your expectations um I feel like you do a lot of things like there's there's a lot of things you do in the world and I love all of them, but how would you describe what you do? Like, do, do you have a title for what you do or do you just kind of do like a long description every time that people are like, hey, Andy, what do you do? That's a good question. And I should have a really clear answer for it, but I don't. Um, you know, I think my life uh, in my creative career went into a million different directions. I think I was always, I was always trying to find you know, what's, what's the best medium for the, the stuff that I've got, you know, what's the thing that's gonna, 
harness whatever it is I am the best. And so I, I've kind of been on a journey doing that for the past 10 years. And I think it ended up being podcasting talks, illustration, all kinds of different things. And I think eventually I got to the point where, you know, it's probably cliche by now, but the whole start with why Simon Sinek thing, I think at some point I transitioned from obsessing over what I should make and realizing that it was a lot more about the why I was making it. And so, you know, I think over the past five or six years, I've become more and more in tune with why I'm making all of this stuff. And then how I'm making and making it and what I'm making is maybe less consequential. And so I would say ultimately the thing that probably defines what I do the most is that I draw invisible things and I'm concerned with invisible things. Uh, There's a quote that you'll hear Mr. Rogers talk about on that documentary that, uh, what is it? Won't you be my neighbor? Oh, so Um, good. So, so good. Yeah. I just, bald like a baby watching that thing. Uh, and he, he says one of my favorite quotes of all time from probably my favorite book of all time, the little prince. And it's, uh, it's what's essential as invisible to the eye. And, uh, I think I'm the type of person that I'm not really into any of my senses. Uh, everything that's sensory is not very interesting to me. I'm kind of lost in my head and lost in the big picture and the esoteric and, and the mystical. And that's what concerns me. And I think that it's easy for us to ignore the things that are beyond our senses when they're actually the most important. And so I I kind of feel like whether it's podcasting or illustration or, or whatever it is I make, whatever the, what is the, why is always the same. I'm always trying to elevate and remind people to take notice of the essential invisible things. So that's, that's kind of why it's sprawled out into a million different things is because I feel like that's a giant task and you need to come at it from a bunch of different angles and actually trying my hand at different things kind of improves my ability uh, in every different facet of the creative work that I do. That's not a very concise answer, but it is an answer. That's what I like to hear. I, and I feel like the way that you described it really resonates with me because I, for the longest time, thought that I was just going to be a photographer. Like I had these dreams mm-hmm. of exactly what I wanted to be, who I wanted to be. I could envision it as a photographer. And then I just began to realize that I could maybe accomplish those things, but there wouldn't be a why behind it anymore. And the yeah. more that I started to kind of pursue that why, I was like, oh, dang, Like this, this is better communicated in written word, or this is better communicated on a podcast. And then it got to a point where it's like, oh, we're going to make a a real, like a print newspaper because that's, it's the dumbest idea in the world, but it's, (laughs) it's maybe the most effective way to communicate a particular idea or a focus or a, a, a why, I guess. That resonates with me. I've thought about it a lot. I've thought about, you know, what mediums, uh, hold that mission the best. And I've found that, I think I ended up getting into podcasting thinking that spoken word would be a better medium for me to explore the invisible things. And when I started that journey, I thought, okay, it's going to be talking. That's going to be the thing. I don't know what it is, but it's this kind of thing. And basically I want to, I want to figure out how to give form to formless things. And it wasn't until I heard a speaker like a few years into my podcast call his analogies and his metaphors and stories illustrations that I realized that everything I'm doing is illustration and that the definition of illustration is actually to give form to formless things. And so I think when that hit me, I probably owned being an illustrator at the core of who I am, whether it is using words or pictures, I feel like I'm always trying to illustrate intangible stuff. That's Um, good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, and I see that in your work and, and I want to get to your work both on the podcast and in spoken word format, but maybe we can back up a little bit because I'm curious about how maybe your why formed through the years and maybe we can even bring it back to like childhood level? Like, where did you grow up? I grew up in Southern Indiana, but we moved around a lot. So I don't really have a place that feels like home. 
I'm that kind of person. Yeah. Uh, my, my dad's job kind of took us all over the place. I ended up living in Western New York and home is kind of an abstract concept to me. Did you have like almost a, like some degree of a cliche of like, home is wherever I'm with you. Home is where the heart is. Like, did you have anything like that where you're like, oh, when I'm moving, here's the consistent thing that makes me feel like home, even if I'm in the Midwest or the East Coast or a different country? Yeah, not really. Um, because <laughs> and it, here, Here's why. I was thinking about this recently. I grew up with my dad and my stepmom, and I, I love them, uh, but I don't, especially when I was a kid, I didn't relate to them very much. And I definitely felt like I was other in that house. Just like, I don't know who these people are. I don't relate to them. And then I even realized recently, I remembered a memory that I had back when I was probably like eight years old, lying in bed thinking my parents are out there watching TV and it's definitely possible that when I go to bed at night, they take their true form as aliens. <laughs> and when I walk out there, they magically transform back into humans or, you know, fake humans. And so I, thinking, about, thinking about that, I know it's really sad, but it's also kind of funny. Um, thinking back to that, I think that was pretty indicative of how I felt about uh, home and in life and all that. I think I always felt pretty weird. Uh, and yeah, and, and I think partially was that was due to the fact that my mom wasn't around and I probably relate most to her. So that probably had a lasting effect. You know, maybe that's part of the reason why I w gravitated to inner worlds and kind of imagination and drawing and, and all that good stuff. Do you mind if I ask where your mom was? Yeah, you. I, I'm pretty public about it. I've talked about it a lot because you know, my relationship to my mom is probably the most formative thing in my life. Uh, it's the reason I do the podcast. It's the reason that I'm an illustrator, why I'm so driven uh, as a creative person. Uh, you know, she's never been diagnosed, but I'm fairly certain that she's also ADHD like I am. And, you know, one of the things about ADHD that I think a lot of people don't understand is that one of the core factors is that we're easily bored and we hate being bored. Hmm. And I don't know if this is exactly it, but she left two families. And I think it has a lot to do with like just boredom of like not wanting to be a mom, not wanting to be a parent, not wanting to be a spouse and wanting to shake it up and go through a new experience. And she never could keep a job and she was very inconsistent. I wouldn't see her that often. And so I think like, as a kid, when I was really little, everybody in my life would be like, you are just like your mom. And I was like, that's amazing. My mom is incredible. She's loud, weird, funny. <laughs> she made, you know, she drew pictures and all. She was just like, I just thought she's the coolest person I know. That's amazing. And then as I got older and I kind of became more aware of who she is and, and the choices that she was making and kind of all the pain that she'd caused herself and everybody around her. And I watched her actually kind of devolve from tragedy to bigger tragedy with drug addiction and all kinds of uh, dire situations. Those early memories of people saying, you're just like your mom became this kind of prophetic vision of doom over my life. So by the time I was in high school, you know, I hated my part-time job and I, you know, I was okay at school, but I really hated it. And I basically was petrified of being an adult and having to get a job and be in a place at a certain time and remember to buy band-aids like that, all of it just, you know, how do you keep your house stocked with this and manage your life and all the maintenance that goes on with that. And I remember just thinking like, I am doomed. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And, and I'm clearly just like my mom. I was like following in her footsteps verbatim. So that ended up being a thing that at some point switched from fear to drive. Hmm. And I think that that came from when I was about 17 and I was still, you know, I was kind of just like passively doing drugs and, and avoiding school as much as possible, avoiding work as much as possible 
having no real path, not really knowing what I was going to do with my life, but also just being petrified of being an adult. And around that time, I got a phone call from my aunt and she said that my mom was in the hospital. This is a lot of information, but it's also stuff that I've talked about publicly. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing all of this. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I got this phone call and it turns out she was, she had had a all day uh, seizure and we, no, no, no one had known that she was having seizures. And it turns out that she had actually been given medication for it, but she wasn't taking it because it affected the, her drug addiction and it was getting in the way she like couldn't get high with this medication and ended up turning into this uh enormous thing and so i went to go visit her and she'd actually ended up having a tumor in her brain they had removed it and ended up taking part of her vocabulary the center of vocabulary in her brain out so she'd lost most of her words and that's a massive thing for her because like i said we're a lot alike and she's a very expressive person. And so going to visit her when I'm like 17 and she has all this stuff she wants to express to me, but she can't remember many words. Oh, yeah. And I remember her just saying something like, uh, you know, she's like starting and stopping a bunch and then saying, you know, I'm so sorry. Uh, and I love you so much. And that's all she could remember saying. Mm. And I, and that crushed me because I loved her. And I, and I do love her. Um, but what was even more crushing was those words from my childhood, which was, you're just like her. Like, this is you. This is going to be what your life is like. And so I, I think I went into a pretty like dark time at that moment. And the weirdest thing is that something really stupid changed everything. And it was the band Modest Mouse. Really? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you ever heard of that band. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I got introduced to this band maybe a few months after that. And I loved the band. But I, what I loved even more was all of their merchandise, all their band posters, all their album artwork and T-shirts. And it was literally like finding a yellow brick road. Uh, it was literally like finding uh, an extraordinary world opening up before my eyes to a future that I actually wanted to go to because I thought, I think I could make stuff like this. Like, I think I could have a future. And for the first time ever, I thought, I'm not afraid to grow up. Like, I'm actually in a hurry to get there. And uh, I think that that's kind of how everything changed. And actually, the moral of the story there, and it's one of my biggest fires in my belly, is that you know, the people making those Modest Mouse posters have no freaking clue how much their work mattered. As far as I know, they were just doing what felt natural to do on this planet. And I'm sure they feel like it's inconsequential. I've sent them messages and told them, you know, I've let them know to the best of my ability how much of an impact it had on me. Uh, but this is one like of my... you found the actual artist of the posters? Yeah. Yeah, and wow. I messaged them and told them, and I tell them that I talk about them in my talks all the time. They're called the Decoder Ring Design Concern. You know, to me, it's such a massive testament because I'd seen what it was like kind of for a creative person to, to say no to the call to adventure and, and the destruction that comes from a life unlived. Uh, you know, they probably think it's not affecting anybody but them. And then I'd seen how life affirming and and life changing someone saying yes to a call as seemingly small as making band posters. And so I think that whole childhood experience and that teenage experience ended up being extremely formative to everything that I ended up doing and it's the impetus behind my career cuz I I wanted to be a different kind of parent um even if I had similar struggles and I wanted to spur creative people on and to take their path seriously. So yeah, that, wow. that's the long, <laughs> you know what I thought I was going to say, you can put this on my, my gravestone. Uh, you know how people say long story short, I <laughs> have to say short story long. Uh, <laughs> so that, that, that's my, I that's love my that. No, I appreciate you. Like that's, that's what this podcast is, is for is making, uh, short stories long or just long stories truthfully told maybe. Um, <laughs> So in the ways that you were similar to your to your mother and and you know obviously the ADHD but also just this I, this generalized idea of like 
wanting new things and, and, and also, you know, the drug use and things like that. Yeah. Do you feel like that was more nature or nurture? Like it was like because you saw that model for you, you pursued that direction or it's like literally probably in your genes. What like, do you have an idea on which direction it was? I think honestly, I think the ADHD thing has a big factor and, you know, I think ADHD is something that's highly misunderstood. Uh, one of the things that, you know, in the way that there's been a lot of awareness brought to autism over the past decade or so, I feel like it'd be great if that could happen for the ADHD crowd, because it's a neurological condition that's, um, you know, been pretty heavily studied and understood. And I think our culture, it's kind of like when you say, yeah, I've got a little bit of OCD or I've got yeah. multiple personality disorder, or I've got, I'm, I'm kind of bipolar just because you're moody a little bit. Uh, I think that ADHD has a lot of baggage I think and it's so. one of the reasons, it's one of the reasons I talk about it a lot. And so I think that's a big factor. I think, you know, her childhood was different to mine, but honestly, you know, we're not the same person. I've since realized I have a lot of my dad in me who's like mm. a successful business person, but I also think that I found a lot of good ideas that she didn't have. And how do you think that you broke that cycle, I guess? Like, how do you feel like, what do you think allowed you to perhaps take a different path or lean into the things that were a little bit different than what your mom had experienced? I could literally go down a million different things because I have a, a lot of ideas of, you know, what helped me maybe not repeat that. One of the things that I think a lot about is uh, this idea that all of that pain and struggle, it feels like a hole is being dug in your heart. And, I, you know, in the same way that my mom was that for me, I had a lot of friends that were probably smarter than me, more creative than me, more talented, and then, you know, got into tons of trouble and got into, you know, the world kind of kicked them in the face. And that caused me a lot of pain to watch creatives go through that. And I think for the longest time, you're kind of just feeling like, man, this life, the universe is like digging a giant hole in my heart. And I think at some point I realized that it wasn't a hole, but it was a well. And that this is like a, a well of passion and drive that has been created from that wound. And I think that I think that's a big part of it. That's a really beautiful metaphor. I've like I feel like we we circle around that topic on this podcast a lot, but I don't think I've ever heard it described like that. I think that's what a beautiful way of describe. That's really good. Thanks, man. Because I think a lot about why why am I so driven and uh, why am I so passionate about helping creative people? And I really think it comes down to that. Is that when you? I think it just comes from you know, being a kid and feeling that kind of pain, it creates a well, I think it can probably do a bunch of things. You know, some people feel so much pain, that hole gets dug so, so far that it goes through the other side and you just become empty. Mm. And, you know, some people go through pain that really destroys them and they never come back from it. And I totally understand that. I think for me, uh, I was probably uh, blessed enough to have you know, my dad and my stepmom who were actually, you know, I didn't relate to them a lot, but they were extremely consistent. Uh, and I think that that probably helped me never bottom out completely. Yeah. But I remember, you know, things like a practical version of that, that just kind of is a microcosm of, a, of the bigger thing is I remember being in first grade and the dare people coming and talking about cigarettes and being <laughs> like, if you smoke, you're going to die. And I, and I, my mom was a heavy smoker. And so it was like, they were straight up saying, and they should be, but you know, they were straight up saying your mom's going to die. And I was like, Oh, you know, Oh my gosh. So I was the kid that like hid my mom's cigarettes in a hole in the backyard or <laughs> whatever, like, you know, trying, trying to help her. And so when I was in high school and this is pretty common for ADHD actually, because it's, they're attracted to stimulants. Um, I was a really heavy smoker from ages probably 15 to 20. And when I found out my wife was pregnant, I stopped like immediately cold turkey. Really? Haven't touched wow. a cigarette since because I always knew, I know for one thing, I'm not going to put my kid through that pain because I felt yeah. it. And so that was that well kicking in. And I think that that's a big part of it. 
But I also think personal philosophy, good ideas that I didn't come up with that I got from uh, spirituality and philosophy and business books and all that kind of stuff, I think together created uh, core values that helped me have better ideas about how to live. I think that that's another factor, but yeah. Like you said, a lot of people, you know, that hole gets dug too deep and they can't, you know, it's hard to come back from it. And maybe with different contexts and environments, but it's amazing that you had the context and and the support and just, you know, your your brain's connected to the right things where you're like, oh, like this is the direction I'm going to go. And I think it says something about your drive. And it, it reminds me a little bit of of something I've heard you talk about before, this idea that we can see obstacles as a sign that we're going the right way. And it's it's maybe a little bit of a of a disconnect, but but to some degree, I think that there's this idea that when you when you are hitting these roadblocks, like the fact that you're choosing a path with a little bit more resistance, where you're like, oh, this is actually unnatural because like this it was modeled for me to follow this direction of my mom, but I'm gonna go this other direction. It's what's allowed you to get where you are today, but it also sounds like I think that has had ramifications in the creative world for you as well. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I didn't realize it, but that idea is really like a big part of Stoic philosophy. This idea, Ryan Holiday has the book, The Obstacle is the Way. And I think that that's a big life lesson. That's probably a a really different part of my personal philosophy versus my mom. I think I saw my mom hit resistance on things and, and just instantly turn the other way where I've tried to train myself. I'm not always great at it, but I've tried to train myself that like, if there are booby traps still set, that means that there's still treasure. Like, Mm. uh, and, and it's this idea in the creative world. I'm always telling people, I'm always talking about how, you know, if there's like a paved road and a, in a jillion tutorials on how to do this thing, like the treasure's gone, but if there's like skeletons and booby traps and people are like, hiding their tracks and it's just straight up wilderness <laughs> like that's the path and and i call it a uh, obstatunity and whenever you see an obstacle uh, see an opportunity like if you you know i think we're training this day and age where if you google a question and there is no answer instead of thinking whoa i've found i've stumbled upon an interesting question i think you're you're quick to feel oh there must not be an answer to that question and oh, I, yeah. I must be digging down the wrong path. Uh, it must be a stupid that's, question. I'm realizing right now that I feel like I feel like that's actually my default response a lot of times where I, I really do see things and I'm like, you know, there's there's billions of people on earth who have access to the internet. Somebody would have asked this if it was a meaningful thing. Yeah. But like that's not true for everything. And oh man, that's such an interesting idea. I feel like in 2008, I felt like that was the peak of the world feeling massive to me. You know, I feel like I was still in a point where I was discovering new music every day and you were seeing things on the internet that you'd never seen or heard about or towns or places or ideas or whatever. And I feel like over the past 10 years, I think we've probably been overstimulated and we've lost our wonder because we're just inundated with so much crap all the time that we don't, realize like Google doesn't have all the answers and like everything that we, there's so much more to experience and understand about being a human than you could possibly contain on the internet. And I think that that's really inspiring to me because I feel like a few years ago, I started to feel really jaded about creativity and and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I flipped that idea of, yo, if it's not on Google, like, fantastic like that's that's where it's going to start getting interesting yeah okay so how do we lean into a little bit more of that wonder then like is is there a practical way other than just like literally like when we wonder things googling them and then seeing if nothing comes like is is there a, a way that like we can train ourselves to to change our mindset around this one of the things i think a lot about is this idea of good taste And I have a lot, a lot to say about it. I've been writing about it. I'm working on some stuff behind the scenes on this topic, but it's a lot of it has to do with having a metal detector 
developing a metal detector, so to, so to speak, a spidey sense, if you will, for what's good, what lights you up and stewarding that and taking notice of that. You know, one of the, I'm not a good joke writer by any means. I'm quite terrible at it, even though I've, <laughs> I've attempted it and I've read books about it and, and I listen to comedy podcasts all the time. But I found that like, when I first started out, I was much, much, much worse because I hadn't trained that metal detector to what's good, what's funny. I hadn't trained my brain to pick up things. And the more I dove into that world and the more that I started to tune my subconscious to pick up, to beep when some kind of material was setting it off, I found that I was overwhelmed by inspiration. And the same goes for mm. my podcast. The same goes for my illustration is there's a real brain training to wonder and awe and excitement and inspiration. And I think it's one of those things, you know, one of the things I, I've, I'm infamous maybe for saying this on my podcast all the time is that creativity is like breastfeeding. The more you pump, the more it flows. <laughs> and uh, I think that we're always kind of like, yeah, I've got three kids and breastfeeding and you know, your way around it. I, yeah. It's, it's a, it's familiar territory in my house. So um, these are the analogies that I have, <laughs> I'm just, you know, writing what I know. Um, but I, I think we have this, you know, with these ideas like writer's block and stuff like that. I think we are really afraid of burning bright. We're really afraid of running out of ideas. And I feel like the more you train your brain and the more you exercise that muscle, the more that comes out, the more inspiration yeah. there is. And I feel, you know, I, for the past f four and a half years, I've been making a podcast every week. I've been, you know, I'm still working full time as an illustrator and, and making products for my audience and all that kind of stuff. I've never done more creative stuff and I've never been more on fire with inspiration. And I do hit, I'm not saying I don't hit uh, burnout and stuff like that, but I feel once you start training that, metal detector in your brain it you take a little breather and you you know take a rest and you're right back in the game so that's kind of my mentality around it i remember when i was first coming up in the world of photography one of the people that i really admired was uh jeremy cowart and he's still somebody that i deeply deeply admire because of the way that he takes ideas and uses them to make a difference in the world and, and, and helps bring them to life and maintain them and sustain them. And one of the tips that I remember him sharing back when I was just a, a mere Twitter follower, probably a decade ago, maybe longer, uh, was that he's like, write down every single idea that you have. And he was using Evernote. So I started using Evernote to basically anytime I had an idea, I'd put it in there. And the, the philosophy, at least in my mind, was put it in there because you might run out one day and you want to be able to come back right. to these. And I don't yeah. think that was his intention, yeah. but I think that that was a little bit of a trap door for me because I started to think like, oh, this is an amazing idea. One day I will execute this when I'm able to executed at 100 percent yeah you know you get five years down the road you've got this notebook full of ideas and you're like i haven't executed any of these because i i've never felt like i was at a hundred percent it's one of those things where i want to believe that the world is limitless and that there's infinite opportunities for creativity like you have to act on that you have to actually take the leap of faith and say i'm gonna i'm gonna do this thing even if it's only 80 percent perfect you know 80 yeah. percent like as john acuff says 80% finished and out in the world is better than 100% perfect and stuck in your head. That's what I'm hearing you say is that you just have to have that leap of faith and actually take action on these things, bring them to the world. And the more that you practice that, the more uh, that creativity is going gonna, is gonna to come your way and you're going to have more ideas and more opportunities. And I would say, you know, it sounds to me like the heart behind what he was saying was less like you better capture all of them because you're going to lose them and more like, that is the art of training your creative metal detector. And, and actually, I think it, one of the ways that you see this and it, it, it rings true in all different creative areas is I am really obsessed with dreams because I have a vivid dream life at night. <laughs> one of the things that they found in dream studies is if you make an effort, you know, a lot of people say, I don't really have dreams. And 
the scientists are always like, yeah, that's not true. You just don't <laughs> remember them. And, and the reason you don't remember them is because you don't value them. And if you start writing them down when you do remember them, your subconscious will actually make an extra effort for your conscious mind to be aware of them and remember them. So the more you take note of them, the more you'll remember them. And the same goes for funny stuff or sad stuff or whatever the creative fodder you're looking for. It, you really have to just tell, you know, poke your subconscious, make a little effort yeah. by writing them down and then also putting them into action. And I think the more you do that, the more your subconscious is like, oh man, you have no idea all the stuff that I'm noticing and, yeah. and picking up on. I didn't know you were interested in this stuff. Go, I'll, I'll, you know, make you aware of next time I see this stuff. We encourage people to do that with good news because, yeah. you know, we see good news all day, every day, but it totally just slips through our mind because we're just biologically not engineered to hold on to that because it, we don't think it's important. But it, it really is just not for our survival. It's just, it's for our ability to thrive. And so that's been hugely beneficial for me to practice that in that context as well. 100%. You know, I've heard before that our brain is actually really deflective of joy and really mm. soaks in fear uh, <laughs> and that you actually have to have kind of a meditative practice around joy and really hold on to it and savor it on purpose. And then I, again, I think that's a thing that you can train your brain to do. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Switching gears a little bit, I, I want to talk about this thing that you kind of alluded to earlier, and I, it's just something that I've heard you speak about as well. You believe that artists can can and do make the world a better place, and you're not just talking about like getting a gig with a nonprofit or getting a gig with a cause. You know, you alluded to earlier the way that you could make a huge difference just by making beautiful things and putting them out in the world. I was hoping that you could maybe dive into where that philosophy comes from for you. Winston Churchill is, uh, gets all these quotes attributed to him that <laughs> he probably didn't say. So I have no idea if he actually said this, but one of my favorite quotes is, you know, they're in the middle of the war and, and they come to him with the budget and they're like, we're going to have to cut all the arts programming. And he's like, well, if we do that, like, why are, what are we fighting for? Like, what's the point of living if we, if we cut all that, like we might as well just give up on the war completely because mm. I don't want to be alive without the arts. And that's how I feel. You know, I think for me, invisible things are what make life worth living. They're the love and family and, you know, that the sense of family, the sense of home, all of these sorts of things. And they're all these really intangible things. And for me, art is the making visible of all, all those visible things, reminding us what life's really about. You know, when you hear a really compelling story, when, you know, I I was a big fan of the show Parenthood. Me it's too. a really good example for me of every week. It was like the best things that you get from a funeral without any of the worst things. <laughs> it was like, remember your life is about your kids. Remember, uh, life is about family and love and, and, and courage and bravery, all these invisible and tangible things. And it's so easy to get bogged down with the sensory and the, and the tasks and the, yeah, the mundane. And I think for me, art is the great reminder. It's that, and also I think even beyond that in a, in a mystical way, I feel like it has, a, it has the potential to, when you're talking about invisible and tangible stuff, you got to freaking work your way around this weird amorphous object, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to try to get, give some shape to it. But I think a lot about synesthesia, uh, this idea that, you know, these people that can see music or smell colors or what have you. And I think a lot about how the dimensions beyond our senses that you know, are above space and time, like where the the source of, existence and the real fabric of our universe lies. I think that's where things like love exist. And I feel as though in the same way that, you know, a sound has a color associated to it. I think that there's a oneness beyond the sensory that is really impossible to nail down with the facts and figures. And that to me, art has this ability to tap into that substance and, and ground us. And I feel like without art, it's really easy to get lost in this third three-dimensional experience that we have. And so for me, 
whether it's a comic, you know, a silly joke or, or whatever, art has this ability to connect us to our most human part of our brain. And, you know, in the same way that you guys talk about bad news is, you know, the reason why bad news is all over the news is because it speaks to the lower parts of our brain. It speaks to our animal brain, you know, the part of us that uh, wants to survive, our, our lowest kind of selves. And it's really easy through all kinds of cheap tricks to appeal to that part of being human. And to me, that's kind of the three-dimensional experience of being hu human, all the like basics. And to me, art is the tool that we have as humans that we can tap in and live into that unique thing that we have as a species, that thing, whatever it is that makes us different. I feel like art is the tool for meditating on that space and connecting back to that space, whether that's you know, bawling in the cinema or whether it's sitting at a stand-up show where we're all become one through this shared laughter. And for a minute, our hearts are all beating at the same pace. And to me, that's what art is. And so I believe heavily in that idea of what is the point of doing this life without it? So like you talked about illustrations and uh, obviously you've got a few formats on how to illustrate ideas. I like this Seth Godin idea where he says that art is anything that's outside of the rule book, anything that's outside of the user manual. Yeah. For people who are maybe listening and they're like, oh, I'm not creative. Like I'm not an illustrator. I'm not even a speaker. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I've never really painted, you know, whatever it is. How can we apply these ideas of, of how to use creativity and art to move the needle and, and like move people uh, and maybe even create more empathy and change minds and hearts. How can we do that outside of the traditional formats of, I guess, art? I'm going to go in two different directions with this. The first one is I really believe that anything can be art. And I know that sounds like a cliche, but to me, art is about really living into why you happen to exist at this point in time. Like what, what's, what do you have to give, whether that's uh, being a plumber or being a podcaster? I don't really think that it matters. I think it, there's a sensitivity. I think, it's a, I think it's ultimately about sensitivity, which harkens back to that idea of taste. Like um, what is your sensitivity? And I think for me, this was something I grappled with. And, and I think it's something that every artist has to grapple with is really owning your art, whether anybody else sees it as art or not. This came to a head maybe three years ago. I was uh, already a full-time illustrator. Uh, that was something I'd done before I started the podcast. It was part of the impetus behind the podcast. And at that season of my life, I was kind of at a crossroads because all the time outside of my paid gigs were spent focusing on the podcast and then also trying to break into the kids' book world. And I came to this point where I realized like, I can't do both kids' books and podcasts right now well if I don't choose one. Hmm. And I realized that I wanted to do kids' books because in my mind, and probably in the world's mind, they were a higher form of art. Totally. Uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they have all the awards and they have all the setup and, you know, who doesn't want a successful kid's book and a Caldecott uh, medal and all that stuff. <laughs> and, and basically when you say I have a podcast, people are like, Oh gosh, you have a podcast. Like, Especially like pre serial, all that stuff too. It's like, yeah. Oh, what, how do I do that? <laughs> what is that? Yeah. And so, you know, it came with all that. There was none of the glamor yes. the, uh, of the art of picture books, all the romance. And I think at some point I realized that art is about impact, not glory. This is a thing I meditate on all the time. It's Art bad. is about impact, not glory. And they kind of, from the outside, look the same. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's easy to fall into that path of, oh, I want the Caldecott, or oh, I want you know what Bob Dylan had, or oh, I want you know I want to be the next this or that. And that romance and that glory is so distracting when really that that widespread 
appeal is about impact. It's about how do you do your art right now? And at that crossroads, I felt like my potential for impact, like there were already thousands and thousands of picture book makers doing things that uh, were making a great impact. But there weren't a lot of people in my space podcasting, and I had to make a decision to see it as my art and decide it was my art and, and treat it with that kind of stewardship. And even if everyone else thought I was stupid for doing so, even if everyone else did not see podcasting as an art of any kind, and I think that was a real shift in my path, and I started handling the podcast differently. And actually, that's probably about the same time that it started to take off in a much bigger way. And so I think that's a big part of it. I think it's deciding anything that you feel like, like I'm here to do this. There's an artistry to doing that. And if you can approach it with that same level of sensitivity of how can I show up in the moment, bring something that's never been brought to this moment, that's necessary to this moment. All of that is, that's the same thing it is to be on stage doing improv. That's the same thing that it is to be writing music. It's being in the moment and bringing what that moment needs, you know, that other people aren't bringing. And so I'll say that, that that's one side to it. The other side to it is I don't think I'm a contrarian, but I don't think any contrarian ever does. Think <laughs> that. Well, that's why it's so hard to realize that you're a contrarian because you've never known <laughs> it. There, there's a lot of like toxic mythology around creativity for me where I think we have a lot of bad ideas about what creativity is. For instance, I think that we think creativity is about new, saying something that's never been said. And I don't think it's really that at all. I think it's more about coming to terms with what the conversation is right now and knowing what to say next to remind us of what we need to be reminded of. So it's really, to me, it's about old things. It's about you know, the things that have always been human and taking stock of, well, what's the current conversation and how do I need to say this thing in such a way that it will feel fresh so that we can remember that old thing? Does that make sense? It's a little yeah. bit esoteric. So I know I love that. I mean, I think about, you know, when you take a Lin-Manuel Miranda and the way that he's, you know, taking a, a medium that people weren't necessarily having political conversations and, and diving into what it means to be an immigrant or, uh, you know, a person of color and, and bringing that to a Broadway play. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's a unique format. And obviously, you know, it's seen by the world as art, whether you're communicating a message or not on a Broadway stage. But like he took something traditional and did something completely different with that. Totally. And I think that comes with, this is one of the places I push back and I want to explain my point a little bit because I, I totally think that in order to make an impact with your art, you do have to show up and do something that's that only you can do. That's something that hasn't been done. But I think that that doesn't start with breaking the rules out the gate. I think it almost always starts with familiarizing yourself with the conversation, understanding, you know, on this date and time, what are we defining as good when it comes to pop music? What are we defining uh, as good when it comes to theater? What What's the definition right now? And that has a lot to do with fitting in and not standing out. Now, that's not the end of the equation, but I think a lot of people want to skip to new instead of familiarizing themselves with old and familiarizing themselves with now. And then I think, and only then, you start tapping into what I call a predictive taste. And it's this idea of like, okay, if this is what's doing it right now, what do we need to hear next? If that's what's good today, what's going to be good tomorrow? And it's not just about fashion. It's about when it comes to truth or it comes to, to being moved or, or touched or or uh, tickled by uh, some art, those methods grow old and, and they grow stale. And the same things that used to tap into our humanity don't tap into our humanity anymore. And so I think that, that the ability to do what the artist needs to do, which is remind us about what it's meant to be, to feel human, comes from really understanding, well, what's, what was doing it yesterday and what was, what's doing it today and how might that affect what we need to feel here 
touch, taste tomorrow. And I think that that's just a, at least in my experience, that's a different path to art than maybe the path that I was given or told. Yeah. So I think there's something there. It maybe even comes back to this idea that you shared so eloquently earlier that it's about having taste and taking notes. And yes. you're paying attention on a deeper level. You're, you're looking at the past, you're looking at the present, and then your creativity comes from collecting all that data and then dreaming up what the future can be and then having the skill set to make it happen. Yeah, totally. I'm just having such a good time with this conversation and I would let it go on forever, but I think that that's, um, that's illegal. Um, <laughs> and so, and so I, I guess I just want to wrap up with this, this question for people who are listening to this and, you know, they, they want to move the needle with, with work that they create. They want to, they want to change hearts and minds and they want to make a difference in the world, but they just, this week, they need a kickstart. They, they need an action step. What's, what would you recommend? You know, cause you've lived this and you, you speak on this and you share about this and uh, I just, I just want the, uh, the Andy J. Miller wisdom. Sure. So <laughs> I, I'll refer to a, a book. There's a book called The Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman. And he talks about this study that these professors from, I believe, Harvard were doing on the core human drives. And this got me thinking about, you know, I'm really interested in art and creativity through a lens of kind of an objective lens rather than a subjective lens. And this gets to the heart of it. And he says that there's five core human drives. We want to learn. We want to feel. We want to bond. We want to protect. And we want to collect things. These are just, that's what people want to do. And so I think that's a good starting place of, you know, when I make a podcast, I'm trying to fire on every one of those cylinders. How can I make you feel something? How can I make you learn something? How can I make you feel bonded with creative people? And, and then once you have those targets, then you can start reverse engineering a strategy and a craft to actually fire on those cylinders. And you can go read how other people do that. You know, when it comes to storytelling, you know, foreshadowing and analogy and metaphor and, you know, callbacks. And there's all these craft elements that you can employ to start learning how to play that instrument, how to, how to make someone feel something. How do you, what's the art of helping someone learn something? And I'm so inspired. You've heard me bring it up a bunch of times. I'm highly inspired by comedy. And the reason is, is because they have such a clear target and I, which is to make people laugh, like that's good comedy. It's just really simple, but it's obviously the hardest thing in the world to do. But I think that's why we have these master crafts people when it comes to comedy is because they know their target, right? And so the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to say, what's good? What's my target? What's the metric? What am I trying to go for? Am I trying to make them feel something, bring them the tears? Am I trying to make them learn a new thing? Am I trying to make them bond or feel self-expressed? What is it that you're trying to do through your art? And then go learn every trick in the book and then learn all those rules and then break them in meaningful ways. And that, to me, that's the artist's journey. That's the whole kit and caboodle. That's my answer. Oh my goodness, truly, Andy is such a wonderful human to talk to, and it was such a pleasure to get to have a conversation with him today. I really want to encourage you to subscribe to his podcast. It's genuinely one of my favorites. I've been going back through the archives and listening to episodes that uh, I had missed, and there's so many good nuggets in there, especially if you are somebody who is trying to make it in the creative world or you need a little bit of a pep talk to uh, help kind of kick you into gear to do the creative work that you want to do. And I have no doubt that if you don't consider yourself creative, there's still so much you can get out of it. He makes the show so fun. Absolutely check it out wherever you listen to podcasts. Creative pep talk. Also, uh, you have to make sure to check out Andy's work. His website is andyjpizza.com and his Instagram at andyjpizza is also amazing. I highly recommend you follow him there. 
If you're new to Sounds Good, we would love for you to stick around. If you enjoyed this conversation, you'd also love my conversations with Brad Montague, uh, who introduced me to Andy. He's the creator of Kid President, among many other wonderful things. And also uh, musician R. Lamar. You can find both of these episodes and more than 100 other episodes by searching for Sounds Good wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure that you hit subscribe to keep on getting more inspiring conversations with incredible people delivered straight to your phone while you sleep. This podcast is created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good Good Good, a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit and mix the show. You can get lots more hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at Good 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 C O and I am everywhere at at Brandon Harvey. Brandon is spelled with an E-N. A little bit tricky, I know. We also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper that celebrates the people, ideas, and movements that are changing the world for the better. It's a real-life newspaper. It's so fun to actually tangibly hold, and you can order it today. Check it out and see what else we do at Good 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 at goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week. And we'll be back next week with another inspiring story from an incredible person. Sound good?